The endocrine system is one of the regulatory systems of your body. It works very closely with the nervous system, but there are some differences between the two. The nervous system is a very fast-acting, short-term response kind of system. It communicates by using chemical messengers that are called neurotransmitters. Target cells for these neurotransmitters are very close. Neurotransmitters are released from the neuron, simply diffuse across the synapse, which is nanometers in width, and affects the target cell on the other side of the synapse. The endocrine system is much slower and longer lasting in its effects. Again, they use chemical messengers, but this time we refer to them as hormones. Now you will find that many hormones and neurotransmitters are the same chemically. What makes them different? Neurotransmitters are produced by neurons. Hormones are produced by glands. Finally, in the endocrine system, the target cells are scattered throughout the body. They're far distant from where the hormone is produced and released. So the hormone has to have a different system for getting around in the body. Hormones have several effects on the body. Hormones play a major role in regulating the reproductive systems of the human. They also are involved in the growth and development of tissues and organs and they are vital in the maintenance of electrolyte, water, and nutrient balance in the blood. Hormones are involved in the regulation of cellular metabolism and energy balance. And finally, hormones are involved in the mobilization of body defenses to help protect you from disease. Several structures in the body can have an endocrine function, but let's look first at the glands that are considered the primary glands. The pituitary is located in the brain. The thyroid is located in your neck. It is the largest of the endocrine glands in the adult. The parathyroids are clusters of five to eight little bits of tissue, usually closely associated with the thyroid gland. Then we have the adrenal glands that sit on top of the kidney, and the pineal gland, which is associated with the third ventricle of the brain. There are several organs that are part of another body system, but they do have a major endocrine function. The pancreas, for example, is part of the digestive system, but also has a major endocrine function in regulating blood glucose. The gonads, the ovaries and the testes, are certainly involved in reproduction, and yet they have a major endocrine function in helping to control the reproductive system. The thymus is a gland that is fairly large in children but tends to disappear in adults. We believe it plays a major role in maturing the immune system, however its role is becoming less clear the more we learn about the immune system. And then finally there's the placenta. The placenta is a temporary organ that is of course involved in maintaining a healthy pregnancy, but it secretes another number of hormones that help maintain the pregnancy. There is one unique organ called a neuroendocrine organ, indicating that it has a neurological piece as well as an endocrine piece, and that's the hypothalamus, that part of the brain that was at the bottom of the third ventricle. As we continue to look at various body systems this term, we're going to find that almost every system has some organs that contain some endocrine cells. Endocrine glands are ductless glands. They don't have any little tube that will deliver their secretions to a particular location. They have to secrete the hormones into the surrounding extracellular fluid. For that reason, there's a very rich blood supply and a rich lymphatic supply to all endocrine glands. It is the blood and the lymph that will pick up the hormones from the extracellular fluid and deliver those hormones to those target cells which are some distance away from the gland. There is a problem with hormone secreting tumors. There are some tumors that have nothing to do with the endocrine system that will secrete hormones. One that comes to mind is small cell lung cancer or what's sometimes called oat cell lung cancer. These cells secrete hormones and they're dumped into the bloodstream. The only problem with this is usually this secretion is excessive, so there's a sudden dumping of hormones into the bloodstream, and it's totally uncontrolled. 
it may today it may secrete for an hour it may not secrete for three days then it secretes for 30 minutes in the middle of the night and then it doesn't secrete this means that the subject the patient is subjected to increases and decreases in hormones that have nothing to do with controlling any physiological part of their system in addition to hormones there are a couple of other chemical messengers we need to mention one are the autocrines. Now, autocrines self-secretors. They exert effects on the cells that secreted the substance. There aren't too many of these, but smooth muscle cells can secrete a substance that feeds back to the cell that secreted it, giving it information to continue uh, contracting. Paracrines act locally. They are secreted they act on a cell different from the cell that secretes them, but they just diffuse short distances through tissues and don't really have a, a long-lasting or long-distant effect. Neither of these are considered part of the endocrine system. Hormones are classified based on the material that they're constructed from. We have a group of hormones that are amino acid-based. Now they may simply be amino acids that have been altered slightly, so they're amino acid derivatives. They may be short chains of amino acids, 20 or 30 amino acids strung together. We refer to those as peptides. Or they may be full-fledged proteins, 200 or more amino acids strung together make up the hormone. The other group of hormones are the steroids. Now, steroids are all based on the molecule cholesterol. Your liver makes cholesterol and it makes it for a reason. Cholesterol is required to build all of your steroid hormones. We'll mention this group here, the eicosanoids. They are all constructed based on a 20-carbon fatty acid called arachidonic acid. They are things like leukotrienes or prostaglandins. These are considered paracrines because they tend to be only secreted and used locally. Leukotrienes are involved in calling specialized immune system cells to an inflamed area. Prostaglandins can help control blood flow in capillary beds. Hormones act to alter normal cell activities, or at least the cell activities of the target cell. There are several things hormones can cause to have happen at the target cell. It can change the membrane permeability or the membrane potential. In other words, membranes are impermeable to certain substances. They're either held inside the cell or kept out of the cell. A hormone may open a gate allowing something to enter or leave the cell that normally doesn't. Or it may cause a cell to develop an action potential. Hormones can alter protein synthesis. Now, proteins can build structures or they can be functional. And most of the time when we're talking about metabolism and we're talking about proteins, we're talking about enzymes. Every single biochemical process that occurs in your cells is regulated by an enzyme, a protein. So if we make proteins, we are typically making enzymes, and this can alter a cell's metabolism by the cell being able to do something it couldn't do before. Some hormones will actually alter enzyme activity. Enzymes can be activated or inactivated by changing their shape. Enzymes work because they fit perfectly on their substrate. If their shape is altered, they may no longer fit perfectly. Or the enzyme may be in the cell in its inactive form, and it may be altered so that now it fits its substrate perfectly. Cells can be affected by hormones causing them to secrete substances. This is particularly true of the hormones from the hypothalamus and the pituitary and the effects they have on other glands in the endocrine system. And finally, hormones can stimulate mitosis. This is particularly important if we're growing or repairing at any time. There are two major mechanisms used by hormones to alter cellular activity. One is the second messenger system using primarily a protein in the cell membrane called G protein. And this is how all of your protein hormones work with the exception of one. 
The other mechanism is through direct gene activation. Now your steroid hormones act, work this way and the one protein hormone that's a little strange is the thyroid hormone. Even though it's a protein hormone, it does not use a second messenger system, but rather uses direct gene activation. So what does a second messenger system look like? Protein hormones are the ones that use the G protein second messenger system. Proteins are too big to get into the cell. Even those modified amino acids are still too big to get into the cell. So the hormone acts as the first messenger. The hormone, in order for it to have an effect on a cell, there must be a receptor on the surface of the cell that recognizes that hormone. So if the hormone finds a receptor on the cell, we have a hormone receptor complex. That complex will activate G protein, which is a protein in the cell membrane. G protein will then activate some molecule inside the cell that acts as the second messenger. It's sort of like having a butler. You knock on the door, you don't get to talk to the person inside, but you talk to the butler. The butler takes the message and gives it to the person inside. The protein hormone is someone knocking on the door, the G protein is the butler, and the person inside that acts is that second messenger. Now a common second messenger is cyclic AMP. Once we have that hormone uh, receptor complex that activates G protein. G protein activates an enzyme called adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase breaks down ATP to cyclic AMP. Now when we do that we're breaking two phosphates off of ATP and we're releasing quite a bit of energy and that's important because cyclic AMP activates protein kinases. Now protein kinases are a group of enzymes that simply phosphorylate proteins. That's a fancy name for saying they take one of those phosphates that broke off the ATP and they stick it on a protein in the cell. Now when they do this, an enzyme is altered. This is where we change the shape of one of those proteins. Depending on exactly which enzyme it is, we may turn on an enzyme because we changed its shape so that it now recognizes its substrate, or adding a phosphate to it could make it change its shape so that it no longer recognizes its substrate, and we've effectively turned off the enzyme. This all sounds a little general, but we don't want to go too deep into this. It's just a mechanism for altering enzyme activity. So let's look at this G protein signaling mechanism. Up here they have people running a relay. And this is sort of what has to happen. So the hormone is the first receptor and it binds to its receptor. It's the first messenger and it binds to its receptor. When that happens, it activates this G protein. G protein then activates adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase causes ATP to break down to cyclic AMP and that provides the energy to phosphorylate a protein. It activates this protein kinase. The protein kinase then activates an enzyme or stimulates a cellular secretion or opens an ion channel. That's what a protein kinase can do. Now another second messenger system is the PIP2 calcium signal mechanism. PIP2 stands for phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. You don't need to worry about knowing that name. In this case, when the hormone binds to the cell receptor, or when we activate G protein, we instead of acting uh, adenylate cyclase, we activate a different enzyme called phospholipase C. Now phospholipase C takes PIP2 and it splits it into two molecules, diacylglycerol, or DAG, and inositol triphosphate, or IP3. And both of these molecules act as second messengers. DAG can activate protein kinases, and we see all the things we saw with cyclic AMP that could happen, and IP3 triggers calcium release and calcium is sometimes referred to as a third messenger. 
Think about some things you know calcium does in a cell. We had to have calcium in order for skeletal muscle and heart muscle to contract. We have to have calcium in order for neurons to release their neurotransmitter. So calcium can do a lot of things just on its own. So with this mechanism, we actually get two possible pathways for altering cell activity. Looking at this one, your hormone receptor complex activates G protein. In this case, G protein activates phospholipase C, which splits PIP2. The DAG activates protein kinase, and you get some sort of cell response. IP3 causes the endoplasmic reticulum to release calcium and then calcium can trigger a whole bunch of different responses in the cell depending upon the cell and exactly what's going on in the cell. So what's the big picture on second messenger? Here is the major flow. Protein hormones cannot enter the cell, they're too big. Your hormone acts as the first messenger and attaches to the receptor on the target cell. This hormone receptor complex activates a molecule in the cell membrane. This cell membrane molecule activates some second messenger molecule inside the cell, and as a result, cell function is altered. The other mechanism is direct gene activation, and this works for steroid hormones. Steroid hormones are lipid soluble, and your cell membrane is primarily lipid, so those hormones will simply diffuse right through the membrane and get into the cell. This means that there must be some sort of intracellular receptor for the cell to be a target cell. The hormone will bind to this intracellular receptor. This receptor hormone complex is known as a hormone response element and binds directly to the DNA. Now once the DNA has this hormone response element bound to it, whatever gene is nearby is activated and genes produce proteins, and most proteins are enzymes, so we now have a cell making an enzyme it was not making before. This means it will be able to carry out a biochemical function that it could not perform before. Here we see the steroid hormone. It diffuses into the cell, binds to its receptor, and you get this hormone receptor complex. This is what can then enter the nucleus. The hormone receptor complex binds to the receptor binding region on the DNA, activating a specific region of the DNA. This causes messenger RNA to be produced, and then the messenger RNA is responsible for the production of a new protein. Since this new protein is more than likely an enzyme, we now have a mechanism, a, a metabolic process that can go on in the cell that the cell was unable to perform previously. We have to keep hormones in a fairly tight level of control. And to do that, most hormones are regulated through negative feedback. Negative feedback, you'll remember, is sort of the way your thermostat works. Hormone secretion is triggered by either some internal or external stimulus. As the hormone level rises, the stimulus is modified, and when it hits some level, the hormone begins to get a signal that it's no longer needed, so the hormone is, release is inhibited. We have to keep hormone levels varying within a very narrow range, otherwise we're going to have problems. Now as we go through looking at how hormones are activated and inactivated, you're going to see that hormone identifying hormone dysfunction can be kind of tricky because there are any number of places that this hormone control can go off kilter. The stimuli that can activate endocrine glands may be humoral, that is a blood level of some substance regulates or triggers the hormone response. Some hormones are triggered by the nervous system, that is neural stimuli trigger the hormone release. And many hormones are triggered through the release of other hormones. One hormone stimulates the release of another hormone. 
For humoral stimulation, an example here is the uh, parathyroid gland. Blood calcium levels, if they get too low, that triggers the parathyroid glands here on the thyroid to release parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone then will do things to help increase blood calcium levels. As blood calcium levels go up, there is no longer a stimulation for the parathyroid hormone and so its release stops. Nervous stimulation is seen particularly through the sympathetic nervous system. You'll remember in the sympathetic nervous system there were a few neurons that went through the uh, ganglion and went straight out to the adrenal gland. Whenever the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, this stimulates the adrenal gland to release epinephrine so that the sympathetic mechanisms can retain function for a longer period of time. And then hormonal stimulation is how the hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary gland and then the pituitary gland stimulates most of the glands in the endocrine system so that we have release of hormones from the endocrine system glands. The endocrine system and the nervous system are closely associated and the nervous system can do some things to tweak the endocrine system. This is nervous system modulation. The activity of the endocrine system can be modified by the nervous system. This allows for some fine tuning of hormone release under certain conditions. When you are under stress, which would be your sympathetic nervous system telling you something, glucose levels may rise higher than if you're not under stress because the nervous system is modifying your response to glucose levels. Hormones are going to travel throughout the bloodstream and go to every single cell in your body. But only certain cells respond to the hormone. They are called the target cells. For a cell to be a target cell for a hormone, it has to have a receptor for that hormone. Otherwise, the hormone just washes on past the cell, or in the case of a steroid hormone, it goes into the cell, can't find anything to attach to, and just leaves. And that is what triggers the response in the cell, that hormone receptor complex. Whenever the hormone binds to its cellular receptor, you're going to change cellular activity. The target cell can be activated dependent upon blood levels of the hormone. If there's a lot of hormone in the blood, you may get a higher activation of the target cell than if there's minimal levels of hormone in the blood. Activation of the target cell will depend upon the number of receptors the cell has to accept the hormone. And it will also be affected by how tightly the hormone binds to the receptor. What's the bond strength or the affinity? Now receptor numbers can change and hormone receptor affinity can change. Sometimes as we age our cells become less efficient at making proteins and since the receptors are proteins the re receptors may no longer be quite the same shape that they were meaning that even though the hormone is just fine the receptor does not hold on to the hormone as tightly as it should. Those hormone receptors are dynamic. That is, they can change in number. We call upregulation the increase in the number of receptors in or on a cell. And sometimes rising level of a hormone will trigger a cell to put up more receptors so that it can be more responsive to that hormone. Those receptors can also decrease in number, and this is called downregulation. Sometimes when there are prolonged high levels of a hormone, the cell starts getting fatigued and begins to reduce the number of receptors so that it's not so busy responding to that hormone. One hormone may be the influence for the receptor change. Progesterone, for example, down-regulates estrogen receptors so that as progesterone levels go up, there are fewer and fewer estrogen receptors. You may have the same amount of estrogen in your system, but the receptors for them are decreased so the cells are not as sensitive to estrogen. Estrogen will cause an upregulation of progesterone receptors. 
So if estrogen levels are high, there will be more progesterone receptors on cells, meaning that a little bit of progesterone can have an effect on the target cell. Hormones can exert effects at fairly low levels. Now hormones may circulate in your bloodstream either freely or bound to a carrier protein. If you think about it, steroids are lipids. Lipids don't dissolve well in water, so steroids are going to be bound to a protein carrier in order to make them soluble. As I said earlier, thyroid is just a weird little protein. It also binds to a protein carrier even though itself is a protein hormone. Protein hormones are pretty soluble in the bloodstream, so they can circulate freely. The concentration of a hormone is dependent on several things. How rapidly is it being released from the gland that's producing it? What is its speed of inactivation or removal from the system? Some, en some are enzymatically degraded in the target cell, so once they get to the target cell and initiate that change, they may immediately be destroyed. But most of your hormones are removed by the kidneys or the liver. Now again, here is another little tricky thing that can affect a hormone condition. What if your glands are not capable of releasing hormones as fast as they're making them? What if the hormone is being inactivated too quickly or not inactivated quickly enough? Or if the kidneys or the liver are not functioning properly, you may have a buildup of hormone in the system which can lead to elevated hormones. So hormone diseases are not easy to diagnose. Once hormones get to the target cell, we worry about their half-life. Their half-life is how long it takes for a hormone in the blood to be decreased by half. The length of time for effects to appear will depend upon the type of hormone. Steroid hormones take hours or days for effects to appear. And if you think about it, steroids have to diffuse into the cell, activate their receptor, which then activates DNA, and you have to make the protein. That's going to take longer than if you just have to activate an existing protein. Hormones also can be released in an inactive form and then only be activated by the target cell. Effects of hormones can be anything from seconds to hours. It's important to control hormone levels precisely so that homeostasis is maintained in the body. Now at the target cells, hormones may display permissiveness, synergism, or antagonism. In permissiveness, one hormone may have to be present for the full effects of a second hormone to be seen. For example, thyroid hormone is essential for the production of ATP and energy in your cells. If it is not present, if you're not producing enough ATP in your cells, then you may not have the energy necessary for other cellular work to occur. So the thyroid hormone is permissive for a great many other hormones to work effectively. Synergism occurs when two hormones work together to amplify the effects. Glucagon will cause the release of glucose into the bloodstream, as will epinephrine. They both target the liver to release glucose. Glucagon typically is there to keep blood glucose levels in that normal range. Epinephrine is released as part of your sympathetic system, your fight or flight system. If you're under stress and you're hungry, both hormones can act together and the effects are amplified, about 150% more effective than either hormone by itself. And the third way hormones interact is by antagonism. Basically, one hormone reverses the effect of a second hormone. This is part of that balancing act for homeostasis. Glucagon acts to increase blood glucose. If it gets a little too high, insulin comes in and decreases blood glucose. If blood glucose gets too low, glucagon comes in to increase blood glucose. So these two guys fight with each other, but the result is a very stable glucose level in your blood. 
the endocrine system and the nervous system are closely related and you see that relationship as you look at the relationship between the pituitary gland which is an endocrine gland and the hypothalamus which is a part of the brain. You'll remember that the pituitary or what we call the hypophysis sits in the cella tersica of the sphenoid bone. It is directly attached to the hypothalamus by that little tiny stalk of tissue called the infundibulum. Now the pituitary gland has two pieces. It has the posterior pituitary and it's really a storage place for the neurohormones that are formed by the hypothalamus. In other words, the pitu pitu posterior pituitary does not produce any hormones. It simply stores and releases the hormones that are secreted or manufactured in the hypothalamus. The posterior pituitary actually comes from nervous tissue and it is sometimes referred to as the neurohypophysis. The hypothalamus secretes a number of hormones that are called releasing and inhibiting hormones. These hormones all stimulate the anterior pituitary, causing the anterior pituitary to either release or not release hormones that target all of the other endocrine glands. The anterior pituitary is the one that manufactures and releases the hormones that control other endocrine glands. The anterior pituitary did come from glandular tissue and it is referred to as the adenohypophysis, the glandular part of the system. So the hypothalamus secretes some neurohormones that are stored in the posterior pituitary and then it secretes releasing inhibiting hormones that control the anterior pituitary's production and release of its hormones. Here we see the relationship between the posterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. These are the specialized cells in the hypothalamus that synthesize the oxytocin and the antidiuretic hormone that's going to be stored here in the posterior pituitary. These neurohormones are transported down axons here to, they're, they're almost like uh, neurotransmitters, where they sit in the uh, posterior pituitary. They're stored there in the axon terminals that reside there in the posterior pituitary and then they're released when the hypothalamic neurons fire various action potentials arrive at the axon terminals causing the release of these. Now the hypothalamus, you'll have to remember that almost all of your homeostatic mechanisms reside in the hypothalamus. So this makes it a wonderful place, the perfect place to regulate the body and then to deliver these more long acting chemicals to the body to help maintain homeostasis. As we look at the anterior pituitary, here we see that these hypothalamic neurons up here synthesize the various releasing and inhibiting hormones. These hormones travel through the portal system here. Now, when we talk about the uh, circulatory system, normally blood comes in arteries directly from the heart empty into capillary beds and the capillary beds empty back into veins that deliver blood directly back to the heart. A portal system is sort of a bypass system, sort of a detour system. In this portal system we're going to have blood delivered via arteries. They're going to go into this capillary bed and this capillary bed is what's going to carry the hormones that come from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary and it's going to deliver the hormones there. This blood then will go back into another capillary bed that will go back into the venous system and go back to the heart. So this is a special little blood supply that delivers those hormones directly to the target cells that are in the anterior pituitary. So let's look at the hormones of the hypothalamus. Most of them target the anterior pituitary and these are sometimes called the tropic hormones. They're all going to end in tropin. So we have thyrotropin releasing hormone, TRH. We have corticotropin releasing hormone, 
gonadotropin releasing hormone, prolactin releasing and prolactin inhibiting hormones, and then growth hormone releasing and growth hormone inhibiting hormones. These are the hormones that target cells in the anterior pituitary so that they will secrete hormones that will then target the thyroid gland, the adrenal cortex, the gonads, the ovaries and the testes, the cells in the breast that produce milk, or most of the cells in the body so that they will grow. The posterior pituitary houses and holds the neurohormones, ADH and oxytocin.